It's good to be back. I did take a couple weeks of a hiatus to focus on some other things and get caught up. It's not enough to just get through the projects I have. I want to make sure I at least try to do them well. So sometimes other things take priority, but I did make good headway with those things. So I'm very excited about that. And just know that I'm never that far away from making another video or posting another podcast. It's never more than a week or two. So I am excited to be back. And whenever there is a drought of content, just know that I make up for it with an absolute deluge of opinions that nobody asked for. I'm going to hit the hyperdrive. We're going to put out a lot more podcasts in this time. That kind of almost binge purge cycle of productivity that I engage in. That's kind of how I live my life. It's how I got through college. So I guess it's well, I guess it's how I didn't get through college, but that's how I'm going to handle this as well. So thank you everybody for your patience and thank you for joining me today. We are going to pick right back up talking about some training principles, some approaches to getting stronger, filling in the holes of knowledge with the putty of wisdom. Sorry, I've been doing a lot of home repairs. So most of my analogies are going to be Home Depot related. Today, we're talking about GPP and conditioning. This is a very popular topic, I guess, well-known topic. Everybody knows what GPP is. There have been endless articles about it. It's almost treated like this kind of big-brained, high-minded approach to training. It was like the extra thing that you add in that's just going to revolutionize your training. And it was this thing that nobody had really labeled or wasn't written about for a long time. And it's kind of funny because when you do talk to people who were champions of years past about their training, there was quite a bit of cro- of cross training and that's not quite well known. I mean, you talk to guys like Kazmaier and they'll talk about how they used to down a protein shake and then go do hill sprints. It was kind of understood that athletes or people that engaged in a lot of different activities had kind of an edge when it came to recovery or when it came to other qualities that in a roundabout way propped up their ability to train and to compete even if you were engaging in something as relatively one-dimensional as powerlifting. GPP is essentially just the participation in these other secondary activities in a way that is going to generally prop up your ability to train and compete, but not specifically do so. And we're going to get into what that means. I'm going to kind of lump conditioning in here as well because A lot of people are interested in maintaining a conditioning base. Not everybody just wants to be a fat shit human forklift that breaks into the trend sweats every time they walk up a flight of stairs. It is good to maintain some basic amount of usefulness, I think. I think we all get into weight training to begin with because we like the prospects of being more useful and we romanticize the role of strength in that end. But strength by itself, without other basic factors to go along with it, it becomes very kind of a lopsided quality, and it actually becomes counterproductive to basic usefulness. So, of course, it all comes down to what you're training for and how dedicated you are to one singular goal versus being useful in the context of a bunch of different other activities. But we're going to get into it, what it means, how to structure it, all of your questions answered right here. No need for follow-up questions. I mean, I got everything right here. You won't even have a question. If you just watch it through to the end, everything is going to be answered. Uh, You'll have a better handle on how to do your taxes, uh, where to invest, how to raise your kids. That's the depth of knowledge that we're about to wade into. So what it is, uh, alternative modes of training, that's probably the biggest thing. It's it's not just more squatting. It's not just more pressing, more barbell work, more gym work. It's doing things that you might not think directly contribute to your goal, but they will again in a roundabout way. Remember general physical preparedness. It's general qualities. This goes back to base building. This is a good opportunity to kind of gently work on things that might be bigger holes in your game. It's not going to be specific to your primary training purpose whatsoever. Most of these activities are not going to provide a direct improvement, meaning let's say you're in a contest peak. If you do sled pushes three weeks out from a meet, your total's not going to go up. But if you stick to modes of training like that throughout your training over a longer period of time, you will find that the benefits that those activities give you actually do help your training. And over a long period of time, that extra efficiency, recovery ability, all of these qualities 
will actually make you a better lifter and a better human being. I'm not going to say people that do GPP are more moral, but you know, you do want those people living on your block. I'm just going to say that. It's also going to increase fitness and fitness can mean a lot of different things. Endurance. Yes, that's part of it, but fitness just means the ability to do things. So however you define that, it can absolutely mean movement ability or flexibility, coordination. There are a lot of things that encompass fitness. And what happens is when you become very, very, very specific, remember I'm always railing against hyper specificity in training, especially with more one dimensional competitive avenues. As you get more specific, you have the potential to be saddled with bigger holes, bigger gaps in your training or your physique. And that's what we want to avoid. And that's why base building is so important. So this is kind of an, a tenant of base building. So the modes of training, they can be varied. In fact, they should be varied. It can include running, swimming, cycling. It uh, can be restorative accessory work. So dumbbells, machines, sure. Bands and cables are great. Things that are generally lighter, oriented more towards blood flow than what you might think of as actual training. Calisthenics are great. All body weight uh, exercises are great. Throws, swings, jumps. You're talking about different movement patterns, different energy systems. You're talking about generally types of activity you're not used to. It can be unilateral. It could be offset. It could be it could even be Joe, uh, Joel Seedman's bullshit chaos training. It can be things that are different for the sake of being different. But understand this is general. As idiots like Seedman say, it's not specific. It's the opposite of specific. Uh, sleds, carries, unconventional training modes, uh, strongman stuff tends to be very good provided the overload isn't too high. So it can include a lot of different things. Now, this is really important what it isn't. It is not a second primary goal that goes along with your first primary goal. If your primary goal is to get stronger, if that means recreationally, if that means to help you with another sport uh, during a certain off season period, if that means to be the best power lifter in the world, if that's your primary goal, the things you do in GPP are not secondary primary goals. What that means is this stuff is on the back burner. This stuff does not take most of your time, energy, resources. This stuff is to gently contribute to your primary goal. So an example of that, if you're prepping for a marathon, yeah, that's on GPP. If you're accruing 10, 15, 20 miles of road work every week, that's on GPP. That's training. It's not bad that you do that, but that's not going to have a lot of the restorative qualities that we need GPP to have for it to contribute to our main goal in the way that we want it to. So that becomes something that is detrimental. It pulls resources away. Now, there are people that do that because they enjoy it. If you're a recreational lifter, it's entirely fine to have two uh, training activities that you enjoy doing, even if they're counter to each other. Some people have actually done that pretty well. I remember Alex Viata was known for being pretty strong and jacked and being a really good runner. He would do marathons, I think, and I believe he had like a 700 pound deadlift at one point. So there's something to be said for being very good at cross training, but there's no doubt that when you are in the throes of prepping for a specific contest or event or skill, doing things that detract entirely from that well of recovery, it's not going to give you the best possible result. So I think intensity, like order of magnitude is a big factor here. How hard you're going, how much time you're spending. Hitting CrossFit PRs, that's another one. It's entirely fine to do CrossFit and strength train. That's fine. But cr hardcore CrossFit workouts are not GPP. That is a secondary mode of training. And again, it limits your potential ability to, uh, to achieve as much strength as you potentially could. And it's up to you to understand where that line is. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. You just have to know that that is not what yields the best result if this is, in fact, a serious or competitive activity for you. A generic accessory, if you have a second day to just going in and smoking your triceps because they're weak and you want to bring it up, that's fine. Again, it's fine to have training that is organized that way, but that's just training. That's, again, not GPP. That doesn't hit our restorative checkbox. Uh, it is more stress. It is more direct, specific training volume. 
So that is not what we are talking about here. And it's not recreational sports. Now I hesitate to put that in because many recreational sport activities do check some of these boxes, but sports by definition are competitive. And that means that when you are doing them, you are doing them very hard. You are doing them to the nth degree. Even if it's just for fun, even if it's just once in a while, that pickup game of basketball that you're playing, again, you may enjoy it and it may be valuable to you, but it's not restorative. It adds training stress. It might very well increase endurance and coordination and all of these other things that you like. And again, that's fine, but that is not what we're talking about. When we're inserting GPP, it serves a very specific purpose. So why do we do it? I mentioned restoration. We do it primarily for restoration. That's probably the biggest violation that any activity can commit to disqualify it from being considered GPP is that it compounds training stress instead of helping to alleviate it. So blood flow is a big one. Just getting out and moving after a really hard workout, it can be huge for helping your body repair the damage. So it absolutely does help with delayed onset muscle soreness. So after an absolutely brutal leg workout, God, me and my wife had one the other day. We hadn't done squat volume since a couple of weeks before our last contest. Those two or three weeks are really all you need. And when strength peaks and fitness drops, that's the worst possible situation to be in because you're strong, but you also have no tolerance to volume. So the weights stay high in your next training session, and it allows you to just devastate your entire physiology. We were obliterated for like five days. We went to a couple fairs. It's Fiesta here in San Antonio, which is really cool. So we've been going all, to all of the fairs and any grassy area. I mean, even lifting our leg to step over a patch of crabgrass. It's like a non-starter. It's like we need everything to be flat, even uh, smoothed over concrete, nothing uphill. It was bad. But just getting out and walking, moving, all of that debilitating pain, it leaves you much sooner if you're regularly engaging in some type of activity that promotes blood flow. It also, and this is a big one, a lot of people don't know this, it is integral to your joints and connective tissue. So those that have tendonitis issues or tendinopathy, those that have chronic overuse issues. I learned this from the arm wrestlers, the guys that would arm wrestle and get this horrendous pain from all of the twisting and torquing that goes on uh, within the upper arm and the shoulder and the elbow. It's all of this unnatural movement. The pain and inflammation is insane. And once they do that, you know, two, three, four hours of table time, they would go do a bunch of banded work to get blood into the joints because blood doesn't get into tendons unless the tissues are sliding. So you need blood flow work to help those tissues repair. Tendons heal insanely slow. So blood flow, I know I'm beating this dead horse, blood flow work, great for restoration, especially if it's low impact. Sneaking in extra training volume, that's another one. Some modes of training can be directly beneficial to the main goal. Um, you can do arm work. I know I said that's not directly GPP if you're going in and you know doing a bunch of skull crushers and hammer curls, but the restorative work you do, let's say you do a banded circuit. Let's say you do a bunch, a bunch of light body weight stuff, a, a bunch of push-ups and body weight squats and so on that can actually contribute to extra training volume. It just has to be restorative, specifically not detrimental to your recovery for it to really count as GPP, or at least that's what we want to keep it to. Because GPP is, anybody can do it, and I think everybody should do it to some capacity, but it specifically is this block that we fit into this bigger puzzle that is competitive preparation. It exists specifically in a capacity to increase our game at the back end. So after we've done all the training, the off-season stuff, we've gone through the very specific training and we got our sights set on a meet. We want to kill it. GPP is part of that equation. I believe it can help absolutely everybody, but it's oriented or it's put together in a way that specifically optimizes uh, performance. So we're not just saying, hey, these are fun things to do that might also be detrimental. So that frames a lot of what we're talking about. We also do it to regulate body fat. Now that's really important because strength sports have weight classes. And this is especially something I'm sensitive to because I have a medium frame. My head is a super heavy weight, but my everything from the neck down, my torso, my arms and legs, eh, I'm more like a 181. So I get caught in this weird kind of hobbit uh, middle ground 
where I'm kind of built like a heavyweight, but you know, I don't really have the joint thickness or the height or whatever else. It's in my best interest to keep my body fat as low as possible to optimize my training. I also joke I'm the world's fattest middleweight, which is absolutely true. Of all of the guys you see that I compete against with at Worlds or the Arnold or America's Strongest Man, I have the most body fat by a margin of 5 to 10%, and it has absolutely hindered me, and I would be exponentially better. Might even be in contention for a podium spot if I did commit to getting the weight off and filling out my weight class. So if you want to be competitive, it is a concern, but it doesn't mean you just default down to the next lowest weight class. You aim to fill out your frame. That means gaining enough muscle, but also keeping your body fat reasonable. It's not just keeping your weight down. It's keeping your body fat reasonable. So GPP is an extremely easy way to, to fit that in. And it checks all of these other boxes that almost make it necessary anyways. So if you add in this element of caloric expenditure, it's just, it makes so much sense that there's almost no reason not to do it. An easy axiom for you guys to follow is move more to eat more. Instead of just dieting down, keeping your caloric intake really low and just titrating it lower and lower and lower until you see the scale starting to move, understand that you can do a GPP workout that maybe burns four or five, 600 calories. And that might be a couple of snacks throughout the day. That might be a smaller meal that will give you that margin you need. And it will also keep your metabolism churning, which is a, a really good thing. So that's really invaluable aspect of GPP. And again, the main reason increasing general fitness, we do it because it actively adds something to training. And again, fitness can mean endurance, mobility, explosiveness, coordination. There's a whole host of things that it can mean that will in some roundabout way, make you a better lifter and improve your game. Now, how we schedule it, pay attention. This is where you want to take notes. You want to really focus on the details here. You carefully plot out where each mode of training lies on the map of all human energy systems. And you have to understand specifically how everything you do affects metabolism. You have to really engage with the complexity here and you have to try to white knuckle it so that you're never doing something that is even remotely counter to your primary goal. All right, you don't wanna do anything that might steal your gains. You don't wanna do anything that isn't strength specific. Don't take the stairs, take the elevator. You are conserving energy for elite performance, all right? Don't stand in line at a buffet. Pay a little extra to sit down at a restaurant so they take the tray of food to you. And then you continue to second guess absolutely every piece of your workout because, you know, when there's a million points of specificity that you have to focus on, is it really ever going to be good enough? Probably not. So. Don't hesitate to just let that wave of anxiety wash over you. And of course, that was very thinly veiled sarcasm. You don't want to do any of that. That is what so many people do with their training. And it absolutely drives me nuts. This is general work. It is not something to be quibbled over. Uh, the most, just like most training, the most uh, mind numbing part of all of this is the fact that so many things actually do work so that all of these different triggers for progress make it hard to kind of commit to something. It makes it hard to pinpoint a decision when each move you make seems just as good as the next one, but that's actually really empowering. It should take the stress off of you that you do have to white knuckle it. It should take the stress off you that you actually do have a lot of wiggle room. Okay. There isn't one right answer here. Just got to check a couple of big boxes and then you can make adjustments as you go to solve a problem, not because you stayed up late at night wondering, is that the perfect GPP routine? So it's general work, it's not specific. It's not like idiots like Seedman say, where standing on one leg, doing a kettlebell press with one arm while rowing a band with the other and standing on a waterbed with a slosh pipe shoved up your ass, that's not specific. That is the definitionally direct opposite of specific, it's general. That's what GPP should be. It's beneficial in a roundabout way, but it's not specifically beneficial, which means you don't have to worry about walking this exact line of carryover. You don't have to worry about walking a tightrope. That's not what we're doing. General activity, which means you have a lot of options, so enjoy that. As long as it's restorative, you check the primary box. 
Is it adding more stress that's going to be, uh, it's going to make it harder and harder to recover from as far as your main exercise, your main training session goes? Or is this something that's going to make it a little bit easier? It's going to shorten your recovery time and make it so that you bounce back faster. There's not really a risk of getting a wrong answer. And there are no bonus points for putting together something that looks perfect. So as I like to say, when people come at me with their annoying questions, shut up and go move. That's it. It really is that simple. Now, here are some of the different types of thresholds that we might work into because you can use GPP for a lot of different things. And if you have some specific areas you think you would benefit from, that's fantastic. It doesn't have to be specific, but if you can pinpoint somewhere where you're deficient and it fits nicely, it checks that restorative box, why not do it on GPP day? Mobility work is probably the biggest one. And I know that there is this, I'm not even going to call it controversial. It's not controversial. All right. You want to be able to move through a reasonable range of motion. If you already do, then okay, maybe time spent stretching. If you enjoy it because it's fun, okay, but it's not necessarily going to make you better. I push this because the trend, the pattern that we see over a long period of time is that people who lift and continue to grow and get bigger and stronger tend to get bound. This is a thing that happens. I've heard people try to argue that, well, it's better for powerlifting performance if the muscle actually does get frozen into place and you can utilize all of those glued down fibers and all of that scar tissue. It's like wearing a bench shirt. So your pec, it's like all mangled and wrecked from years of abuse and that scar tissue doesn't give. So that bar just struggles to get down to your chest. There are guys who need 500 pounds on the bar to get the bar down to your chest. I guess that's great if you want to be toe made or if you want to be a rusty forklift who uses a bunch of artificial mechanical tension to support the weight. That's one way to go. There's a very real trade off in that and that you will have less utility in a lot of other things. It will limit what you can do. I don't think that is the way to go, especially given the number of strength athletes who get extraordinarily good without any of that nonsense. Olympic lifters don't have that luxury to get stiff and bound. A lot of strongmen, Martins Lisa is one of the best examples. Look at his mobility, his shoulders, his hips. Look what he looks like. Look at what he looks like when he hits a rock bottom squat. This is not somebody who relies on mechanical tension to support the weight. And this is somebody who has a lot more utility. And when a strongman career is over, he's going to be able to do a lot of other things. So I think there's a benefit to that. Anything that improves your ability is great for GPP. That can include dig up your dusty old copy of Supple Leopard back from when Kelly Starrett was uh, relevant. Uh, knees over toes guy. I've actually done some of those drills. Work on bulletproofing joints that are susceptible to problems. You know, it can be key stretching. It can be uh, stuff to target a particular joint, certain exercise like that. It can even be yoga. Yes, it can absolutely be yoga. It could be Pilates for all I care. Bust out the Pilates ring, you know, put on your 80s neon spandex. It counts as long as it's active. No, getting a massage does not count. It's not active. That's somebody doing something to you. Uh, it might increase your mobility. That might be something you do as part of your generic uh, or general restorative protocol. And that's all well and good. But no, that does not count as GPP. Uh, massages, I do not believe increase your fitness. Um, I don't know. Maybe there's a psychological benefit in there. I'm not, I'm not, uh, pinpointing. It depends how rough they are with the happy ending, I guess. Uh, fat loss, all GPP counts for fat loss. Anything that is active, anything that you are doing will expend calories and it is extra work that will contribute to fat loss, but you want to keep it on caloric expenditure because that is the big thing. Don't let yourself get caught up in thinking that um, it has to be optimized. Again, that goes back to trying to white knuckle it and control for things that you actually don't have the ability to control for. For a long time, I was in the high intensity camp for really no other reason than I came up at a time where every other article in every magazine had some write up about how supremely beneficial high intensity interval training was. It was to the point where they had some magazine spread, they did a photo shoot with like Johnny Jackson and they showed him on an actual track, like a college racetrack, like, and it was like perfect running for him, hands open, you know, it's like, like hip to elbow, like he was tossing his hands. You could tell he was opening up his stride. Like there was some good form running going on there, but it led you to believe that like 
career bodybuilders would go out to the track and do sprints. Even when you're looking at what Kazmaier used to do or what guys with football backgrounds used to do, that was kind of emulating the athletic component of, uh, of football and of field athletics. But like bodybuilders, there's no bodybuilders going out and sprinting. High intensity uh, interval stuff. I've never heard of a bodybuilder who only does short, brief interval sprints. Every bodybuilder I've ever met glues their ass to a treadmill on an incline because it's more muscle sparing and it's less impact. So that's my experience. So anyways, long story short, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. You just need to burn calories. And ideally you do it in a way that's done with the lowest impact. If you're young, your knees are, he- your knees are healthy, you like running, and it doesn't seem to interfere with what you're doing in the gym, that's fine. But understand that that, uh, that hubris that comes from having young joints, it's temporary. And if you get comfortable leaning on that artificial sense of pride, that you actually can do all of these things together and still lift as hard as you want and then still feel good at the end of the day, oh, father time is going to come and slap you across the face. Eventually, you will likely, not everybody, but likely find that certain activities just do not go well with regular training. This is why we talk about priority. If your priority is to be an athlete, then your training is what changes to accommodate those athletic endeavors. If your priority is training, that means more time and energy is going to be spent under load, stressing joints, which means the alternative. It means that these activities have to adjust in order to accommodate the priority, and that is to train and get stronger, and we use a lot of volume with that. So anyways, just be aware. If your joints start talking to you, do not hesitate to switch to another mode of training. I love running. Right now, I'm too fat to run. When I lose about 40 pounds, I might try it again. Even jump roping actually lit me up. Uh, At the moment, I have to limit myself really to being careful with my squatting and I have to limit all of my GPP to basically sled work and cycling. That's kind of where I'm stuck right now. And there is nothing wrong with that. Don't be stubborn. Let your body tell you what the appropriate course of action is. Anything, anything that causes you to move is going to cause fat to, to drip off of you. Okay. Running, swimming, jogging, strongman stuff, carry sled circuits, Interval steady state doesn't matter, but I like to keep it simple. I do like intervals here and there, but when I'm doing fat loss stuff, steady state is just kind of where it's at. Put it on a 10 incline, you know, 2.8 or three miles per hour. See if you can hold that for 40, 45 minutes. Put on an audio book, listen to a podcast, listen to the base strength podcast, catch up on what's going on in the world of strength, expand your education and that extra time spent will be good for your mind and be good for your waistline. Endurance and conditioning. Huge facet of GPP. This is probably one of the biggest ones because the selling point is that by getting your fitness up, your aerobic capacity up, your general conditioning up, you can do more work in the gym without without just melting into a puddle of fat. Okay, You want to be able to get through your heavy, serious workouts, your dedicated specific workouts like a man possessed. You want to be aggressive and you want to rest with just enough time to recover, but not so much time that you lose sight of what you're doing or lose momentum. You want to be able to tear through this stuff. The more conditioned you are, the better your capacity to do that. So in that way, yes, being conditioned does help immensely with strength training. Your ability to to tolerate volume will go up. Your ability to recover in between sets will go up, making your training sessions more dense. So do not try And this goes back to like this not being another recreational sport or primary, uh, a secondary primary goal, if that's an oxymoron. Another goal that you also take very, very seriously. Do not try to make your conditioning sport specific. Conditioning isn't sport specific anyways. That's the first point. If you are conditioning for lifting, it's GPP. If you are conditioning for another sport, that's training for another sport. And that training structure should come from somewhere else And it implies that lifting is not the end all be all for you. Again, it's fine. It just requires different, uh, different variables that you have to pay attention to. It'll also cause you to overthink. All right. If you really try to say, well, what energy systems are involved in powerlifting and how can I best reproduce that in my GPP, you will end up putting together some mangled mess that is born out of the delusion that you can control for all these variables 
in a way that is meaningful and productive. You can't, so stop it, don't try. You want to opt for lower impact activities with endurance. Again, it implies more time, more total effort going, is going to be expended. So every step you take can have potentially a detrimental effect on your training. If it plays into overuse issues or tendinopathy or any other issues that you might have, running and explosive stuff might lead to that. So like I said before, just keep that in mind. If those issues pop up, go to something else, rowing, cycling, running in sand. I don't care what it is. Don't be stubborn. And you want to opt for a wide variety of activities. Sleds, carries, and bodyweight activities are absolutely great. Like little Metcons or strongman type medleys. You can take anything from chin-ups and push-ups and dips. I like to do a band assisted. So you can do a few more reps and it's less wear on the joints, especially if you're a little hefty like I tend to be these days. I like to pair those with carries. You know, you can do light farmer walk carries. You can do light uh, sandbag carries. If you have a light tire, you can do flips. Explosive stuff. You can swing a sled. Swing a sled. Swing a sledge and pull a sled. And you can pair these things together in ways that are fun and interesting. Put them together on the fly. Don't stay up like I do with the whiteboard behind me. Writing and erasing a bunch of different confirmations of training because I'm fixated on getting something that looks a certain way on paper. Go out, see what uh, equipment you have available, see what the mechanics are of setting it up. Honestly, the logistics of how the gym is set up will often tell you which medleys make sense and which don't. It can be long, slow distance, hiking, cycling, walking on an incline. It can be intervals, just like the, the stuff we talked about. It's all good. If you put in any amount of effort to it and you're consistent, your endurance will improve in a way that will make your lifting better. Weak point targeting. So this goes back to sneaking and training volume. Now it's in a very roundabout way. So that's important. I'm not talking about going in and doing a bunch of hard dumbbell or machine work, especially not barbell work. This is smaller movements, things that will not tax you to the degree that it will push your recovery back. Remember it has to be restorative. So you limit it to small movements, specifically low impact variations. Banded stuff is fantastic. Uh, it can involve certain machines as long as it's not a, a type of movement that is likely to lead to delayed onset muscle soreness. So remember that. I like to do bracing, reverse hyper work, erector work is great. Any abdominal work is great. It can be sit-ups. I would say if you're conditioned to it, it can be 90-90 uh, breathing, it can be the McGill 3, it can be anti-rotation movements, it can be a whole, a whole host of bracing exercises. You can do them by themselves. Or hey, why not throw it into a circuit as part of a couple of other things you do in sequence because that's more efficient and will help your fitness. Blood flow work is great. That could be, I would say not do occlusion training. I mean, that's you know blood flow work because that tends to make you sore as shit. But blood flow in the sense that you're doing a lot of reps against cable or band tension, ideally, to get blood into the joint. And it takes a while to get conditioned to it, but when you do, it will not make you sore. Uh, shoulder rotation, you know, get your external and internal rotator stronger. Glute activation, it's a good opportunity to practice your clamshells, your glute bridges, or, you know, if you have problems with your hips doing what they're supposed to do, you can put that in here. Calves and forearms, those don't need to really be fresh on any of your main lifting days. And if they're a weak point, you can sneak that stuff in. And it's all extra calories, extra work, extra training volume. So some example workouts. First of all, you're not going to do all of these. I did not list these one, two, three, four. So you can write these down and do these all in the same training session. You might pair together two, maybe three of these in any one GPP workout. And you can bounce back and forth. You can have different GPP workouts that prioritize different things. If you're not really trying to emphasize any one particular quality, mobility, I believe, should be in everyone. Ideally, everybody does five or 10 minutes of just rope minimum mobility work at the beginning of every workout. Anyways, you don't have to, but it's a good habit to get into. There certainly is no negative consequence of it. But as part of your GPP, it's a good way to get warmed up. If any of you have problems, if you're like me, you can't cross your legs because your glutes are too damn tight. If you have trouble tying your shoes, if you can't touch your fingers behind your back, this is where you can work on that. Some knee over toe exercises. Those are a good, uh, good movement list. 
to pull from when you're trying to put together a GPP mobility workout. And then a couple of targeted stretches. It's not hard. Move through them in sequence. You would be surprised what they do to get your heart rate up and what they do in terms of just physical movement activity, but it's all going to making you more useful and helping out your training in a more roundabout way. Just imagine if you could move better, the number of different exercises you would be able to do. I have people that can't front squat. They can't even cross over because their mobility is so bad or because their ankles suck, their shoulders are too tight, whatever it is. Imagine how much more you could do in your training. Imagine how much would hurt less. Imagine how less, how much less hesitancy you would have to do some of these exercises. It's important and it doesn't take long. Bracing work is great. Again, 90, 90 breathing, three sets of five breaths. If you're not used to it, that'll have your head turning purple, have you sweating bullets. Then we go three anti-rotation movements, all great exercise. Generics ab work too, generic sit-ups, uh, planks, static movements, the leg raises, whatever you want. They all work well and they all have a place in here. You could do a circuit. I like picking a chunk of time and just filling out that time with movement at whatever pace I can. Chin-ups, push-ups, sit-ups, squats. It really is that easy. Only do a few reps so you're not getting sore and bounce from one to the other in sequence and keep moving until the time caps up. Work as hard as you feel like you can that day. Band circuits for accessory. I have a lot of clients do this. If I think they're working too hard, they want to get in four days a week, and I think they only really need three hard workouts, I'll have them do a fourth day of band circuits. And they hate it because it's hard, because it burns, but it doesn't tend to make you sore. So you tie up a band, you can do curls and press downs and rows and pull aparts and front raises. You can even do some lower body stuff. 50 reppers. Your upper body is going to be pumped, but it's going to help. That blood flow is restorative. It shouldn't make you more sore for your next workout. It's also worth pointing out too, I didn't say this explicitly, concentric only stuff tends to be really, really good for GPP because the eccentric tends to be what makes you sore. The eccentric, the lowering phase tends to be what tears muscles down. So if you remove that, then you're left with extra training volume and extra calories burned that doesn't specifically tear down muscle tissue. So that's great for something that's restorative. That's why sleds work so well. Sled death, drag it backwards 100 feet, push it 100 feet. If you have a prowler, just tie a strap to it. Push it forward, drag it back. Do that for 15 minutes continuously at whatever pace you can. See if that doesn't put hair on your chest. You can do sprints. I like sprints too. Go hard as you can for a given distance and then rest a minute, 30 seconds, whatever you're capable of, and aim for a specific number of rounds. You can build off that each time. Sleds are great because they are concentric only. There's another exercise I saw Matt Wedding push. It was like wearing a weighted vest and standing on a treadmill where it's off and you're pushing the belt to keep it going. And you would do that for a specific uh, amount of time. That's kind of akin to pushing a sled. It's a burner and it's easy to do. You don't need a, a long runway to do that. Strongman medleys, I'm a huge fan of. And you could even, you know, soften these up a little bit. They could look a little more crossfit a little more accessible to the average person. But uh, any type of carry, farmers are great. Stand anything to the front, huge for your posterior, your lower back, your hamstrings, your glutes, absolutely fantastic. You go 100 feet of farmers to 100 foot sandbag carry to some type of like explosive movement. I like pairing different energy systems in these little medleys. So something that's a little bit slower with something that's a little more explosive. Med ball slams, sledge swings, um, plyometrics are good. You can throw jumps in there for so many reps. Um, even just a kettlebell, you know, doing a kettlebell swing all work really well. Five rounds for time Say, Hey, I'm going to move at a steady pace. How many rounds of this can I get through in five minutes? I recommend not going too heavy on these because if you're not used to it, that actually will mess you up for your next workout. So it's important to modulate the effort and the weight that you're using. This is the one nobody likes. This is the last example on the list, low intensity, steady state. People hate that. They hate that I talk about it. They hate that I bring it up. It was a joke for a long time in powerlifting culture. You know, cardio, no, re-racking my weights is cardio. And it has become a self-fulfilling prophecy and it's ingrained itself in the psyche of lifters where everybody now believes that steady state cardio, doing anything for more than 10 minutes is detrimental to gains. And it's not, first of all. Nobody ever lost an ounce of gains because of 45 minutes of activity. That's not a fucking thing. It doesn't exist. Stop it. What you do see are that some of the strongest, most physically impressive, capable people on the planet 
actually have impressive cardiovascular abilities, at least relative to most strength athletes. So there are plenty of examples of everything from rugby and football players to strongmen, um, even to people that just train recreationally. Remember that, uh, forget the guy's name, a functional guy that would do these like elaborate circuits. God, I was on such a good tear and now I sound stupid trying to think of this guy. It's a guy that would have a weighted vest on and like camo pants and he'd be like doing tire flips into hurdles into like a 600 pound deadlift. I don't know, he was a bad motherfucker. But the guy was every bit as strong as any one of you would want to be and twice as capable. And there's kind of a, a superpower to that. You don't have to take it to the extreme like that guy, but it is important to know that you should be able to handle a basic amount of consistent effort. If you wanna be useful in the gym, if you wanna be useful to your lady or as a man, okay? Don't let the stigma of cardio keep you from having some bare amount of utility because when the war comes to the front lines of your nation and you're called to serve, all right, it's time. Spent my whole life training. It's time to show I'm worth a damn. And you are overlooked because you don't pass a basic physical because even though you have a 500 pound bench press, you have high blood pressure, and makes your vision suck and you break out into a sweat after doing a couple toe touches and fall on the ground and start seizing. Okay. It's important to have a basic amount of utility as a person. If you give that up and I believe this, this is an ideology, but I believe if you give that up, you ruin the value and the benefit of strength training. I believe strength training is only as useful as it makes you better at other things. That's my personal belief, but hey, teach their own. Anyways, steady state cardio is a fantastic tool. It will improve your game and it will do so much for you that there's no point ignoring it other than you just don't want to do it. So remember that. So that is my rundown on GPP. It is easy to do and it can do so much for you. So like I said, stop second guessing it. Stop coming up with excuses. Shut up and go move. Thanks for listening, guys. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.